He's got a dog that all of a sudden doesn't mind him and runs away. He doesn't have control of him. He can only have control of him when he's on lead. He jumps the fence and he escapes. The only way he gets him back is he pretends he's leaving and the dog doesn't want to be left behind and wants to run in the truck. You got holes in your foundation. You didn't do as good of a job as you think you did. You're a team. You got the dog and you got you. And if you don't hold up your end of the deal, the dog's not going to hold up his end of the deal. The dog's lost respect for you. The dog has de defined itself as the leader in your relationship. you got to set yourself up to be successful. That's the responsibility of you as the trainer. If I took a dog that doesn't recall to an area that I lost 100% of the control to, they can do whatever they want, there's nothing I can do about it. And then I ask them to recall and they don't recall, and I get frustrated about it, whose fault is it? For this podcast, we're going to go back to our roots, which has been, a, our, our podcast has been driven heavily by questions based on Instagram, um, Facebook, I think we've even done maybe some, touched on some YouTube mm -hmm. questions, because we are getting a lot more of those um, in recent times, but, uh, and so, and some of them have been emails even. So, there's lots of ways to reach out, there's lots of ways for us to um, connect with you guys, and the podcast is another extension of that. So um, I have chosen a Instagram. Uh, it's from a guy named Jacob Coburn. Um, Jacob, it's recent, like it just came to me. Uh, the question that I'm going to read to you and discuss, it came yesterday. I have a lot of messages and questions that I need to get back at and I'm working at that. I was just telling Ben, I opened up our Facebook messages. I've got, I have not gotten back to people since before the weekend. So I'm four or five days out right now and I'm going to spend I'll spend a bunch of time catching up on those. So I appreciate your patience with those messages and questions that come. I don't always get back right away just because I kind of take things in order of when they come. So let's talk about this one because this is a big one. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, it's quite a narrative um, in this latest message. But then what I did was I wanted to get a little bit of history with it. So I looked back on some of the prior messages. This is not the first time Jake, Jacob has sent me a message. Um, his message thread started back in January. Um, so what I did was I read this latest message, which is sizable, and it's a big, I think it's a really big thing that a lot of people probably face one way or another to some degree or level. Jacob is experiencing it to an extreme right now. It's creating a lot of issues for him. I can tell by reading this. Um, but what I did was, in order to get a little bit of a backstory on it, I was able to read back on our messages prior, and it's interesting what I'm going to share with you of how the messaging started and where we find ourselves now. Remember, February, it's, it's May right now, mid-May, so March, April, May, three months ago is when the, the message started, and when it first started, it was real positive. It was actually really good stuff. Things sounded like they were going very good. I'll, I'll get into that here in a second, but let me read the recent message that came in yesterday. Hey Jeremy, I need some advice. My male dog is absolutely driving me crazy. He a, has a bad problem with running from me a long time and I just can't seem to break it. It's as if all he wants to do is run away and not mind. He learned he can jump our backyard fence at an early age, which has turned into not being able to let him out off lead. He's decided now to bring his stubbornness into training and simply runs off mid-drill. He's progressively developed more and disregard more of disregard for the whistle, and when I call him to, to the point where the only time and when I call him to the point where the only time I feel like I have control is when he's on lead. I really felt like I was doing a good job with his foundation, and he's always been eager to train, but this has gotten out of hand. At times, it's so, I get so frustrated. I think I'm I'm going to give up, but I'm not a quitter, and I can't bring myself to do it because I know he. I know he can be great if he can stop being so damn stubborn. What can I do to get back on track? As soon as he starts the behavior, it seems like the only thing I can do to get him back to me is to start the truck and act like I'm going to leave. Then he comes back acting like a scalded pup ready to do anything I say. It's only after that a lot of times that we can have a decent training session. I've never had an interest in using a shock collar and I don't want to be afraid of me and I don't want him to be afraid of me spanking him but it's extremely hard to keep my temper with him when he runs from me like that. It's at that point normally that I'll end the session as opposed to trying to train him while mad. I guess more specifically what can I do to regain his focus when he is make 
making a break for it on the brain or train to train him to refrain from doing so. I greatly appreciate any advice or criticism. Okay, there's a lot there. Let me summarize it. He's got a dog that all of a sudden, it sounds like, doesn't mind him and runs away. He doesn't have control of him. He can only have control of him when he's on lead. He jumps the fence and he escapes. The only way he gets him back is he pretends he's leaving and the dog doesn't want to be left behind and wants to run in the truck. That's the Cliff Notes version of that. The other things that are major bullet points is the level of frustration that this is creating for Jacob. Uh, he's contemplating quitting at times, not that he's going to, but it's to that level of frustration. He's questioning a shock collar. He's questioning the idea of spanking the dog. And so we're gonna talk about all these different things. Um, but now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go, man, I, I read this, this is my interpretation of it. I read it as a, a guy who he's sending it to with looking for advice and I go, what happened? And where, where was he at? So I always scroll back and I go, man, we've, we've messaged quite a bit. So A, how old is the dog? I don't know how old this dog is. I mean, I've, I've heard some people send messages like that. They're so frustrated, ready to quit, all this stuff. If the dog doesn't listen, blah, blah, blah. Very similar situation. And then I find out that the dog's 12 weeks old. Now, I, I know that that's not the case. I'm going to tell you why I know that. But I have heard people say that. So in that situation, my answer is just take a deep breath and realize what you're turning this molehill into as far as a mountain. And, and recognize that it's not that big of a deal. I gotta take a step back, I gotta cool off. Uh, it's more of a, in that situation, I say be patient. Be patient, be consistent, things will start going. And, and at, quit pressing, quit holding such unrealistic expectations that you need these results that you're looking for with a, you know, a young dog. Now, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go way back to the very beginning, January, first message I got from him. Hey Jeremy, I just wanna thank you for sending you a message and say thanks. Recently got my hands on your foundation DVD as well as a shed DVD. I have two dogs I'm training, Hank, a lab mix that's 23 months old, and Dixie, a lab mix at seven months. So we had a two-year-old dog and a seven-month-old dog. Very dramatically different spots as far as maturity, right? So he says, tonight was my first time trying and successfully training both my dogs together in the backyard. So he goes through this idea that he's training these dogs, he put one, he's putting one on place and he's working with the other dog and it's working for him. So he switches them in and out. So he said, my point is without your help, I was gonna be over my head trying to train these dogs. Without place training, there's no way I could train them together before I had them to separate them completely. Um, so he goes through and he starts talking about, he's seen some videos, he's watching stuff on YouTube. Um, some of the best advice I got was to order this book, um, Richard Walters, Water Dog, followed by advice to get your training DVDs. So he's getting advice from other people. He's finding different resources, he's grabbing it and using it, implementing it with his dogs. He's having success. Uh, Hank's a great hunting dog, this is the older one. Um, all the gaps in his training are from him, based on, you know, from him as the trainer. Um, now he's gonna prevent those types of issues with the seven month old dog. Is there any advice you have for me for training them both concurrently, thanks in advance? So I responded back, I said, you gotta train them separate. You can't train them together. A seven month old dog can't be working with a two year old dog. They both have to be trained individually and then you can slowly start to work with dogs together. I'm doing that with Bella right now. Bella is very good by herself. She really struggles with other dogs. It's a distraction, it's a focus thing and we're gonna slowly work our way to working her around and having her be patient and watch other dogs do a lot of work and not do it herself. So it's a process. So I basically said that to him in a message. Um, he said it's a good point. I know um, when I think of them in comparison, I do consider Hank to be older, although he's only two. Um, so he, so that was a mess. That was that was months ago. That was in Feb January that we were messaging that back and forth. Then he sent a message in end of February. He said, "Is there any harm in taking a dog that's not quite ready to shed hunt, shed hunting? Uh, I'll keep him on lead. I'll keep him at heel. Sort of what you do when you were hunt when you were taking Bella along and implementing some drills last fall when you were grouse hunting." So we, we, he followed us last fall. We took Bella with us. She never hunted. I left her in the kennel or at the cabin. When we had fresh birds, she had an opportunity to make some picks. So we just, we really controlled the opportunities, but they were a little bit closer to the real thing. So he's asking, can you do that with the dog in February shed hunting? And my answer to him was sure. Shed hunting is the one thing that I don't think you're gonna risk a lot of things by going early. I do think you risk it if you have unrealistic expectations and you get frustrated if the dog doesn't do well. So that was kind of how I explained it to him. I said, you know, it's just, 
you know, you, you, you take advantage of the opportunities and times that you have in this limited season of shed hunting. So he said, sounds good. Um, you know, he's get, the dog gets more excited for birds than it does shed, so he's gonna bring the dog and see what he can do. Sounds good. My answer was be patient and keep moving forward with your progress. Now, that leads me to the me this last message. So it's been since February that I heard from Jacob, and now you, I read you his problem in the beginning. Dog doesn't listen, dog doesn't come, dog runs away, all he wants to do is uh, disobey, he's stubborn. So I'm looking at this and going, I'm assuming it's a seven month old. And now I'm assuming it's a 10 month old. It could be wrong, could be the 23 month old, now it's 26 month old. I don't really care what it, which one it is, if it's the older or the younger or both. Here's the issue. It didn't just happen overnight. It, it didn't go from things were going really well. And I think, so I'm gonna break down this latest message and he said, um, Let's see here. He said, I really felt like I'd done a good job with this foundation. And he's always eager to train, but he has gotten out of hand. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, Jacob. Like I, I, and I'm not going to say this jerk either. I'm not going to say it to be a, 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 a total ass about it. But I'm going like, to be like that buddy that just tells you the truth. Like, and I'm, I'm not, you got to hear it. You should hear it from somebody. Something has happened here. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't go from everything was going good to all of a sudden the dog just 180. Somewhere along the lines, this has been progressing the wrong way. Okay? That, you didn't do a good job with the foundation. There. I said it. You feel like you did a good job with the foundation. And probably you did for points. For parts and pieces, you probably did. And th that's where you got this false sense of, you know, the foundation is good. I'm telling you right now, if you follow Bella Be Good, if you follow the series Bella Be Good, she's a, a little over a year now, I still haven't done a good enough job with her foundation. So don't feel bad about it. Jacob, I'm not saying this so that you, sh you take it personally, because you could tell me that. You could say, Jeremy, you haven't done a good enough job with Bella's foundation. I would look you in the eyes and say, you know what, you're probably right. There are a lot of holes in her foundation right now, and that's what I need to fill in if I intend to do what I want to do with her in the end and what we will do with her in the end. So it's not a, it's not a bad thing. It's an honest thing. You got holes in your foundation. You didn't do as good of a job as you think you did. So what? Now what? Do you sulk about it? Do we get bitter about it? Do we get frustrated about it? Do you quit? You've brought up a few of those points. You've been very frustrated. You're, you're, and some of it is being deflected back to the dog. The dog is being stubborn. No, you're just not doing a good job with them. And the dog is, is acting up. The dog is not being very well disciplined. And it's not the dog's fault. It's your fault. But it's a, it, you, it, it, you're a team. You have the dog and you got you. And if you don't hold up your end of the deal, the dog's not going to hold up his end of the deal. Now, the great part about this is, if it's the 10-month-old dog, the great part about it is, the dog's only 10 months old. And from what I'm understanding and reading, at some point you had some pretty nice stuff going. So you just gotta go back. The great part about this is, is it's real fixable. Now you've said that yourself, the only time you've got control of them is on lead. You better start working on control. I wouldn't work on anything but the idea. It needs to be perfect on lead before you can come off lead. Recall. So if, the, if you take the dog out and the dog runs away from you, my question is, where are you working with it? The dog shouldn't have the opportunity to get away. Now, you, you, at the end there, you started bringing up some of the, some of the um, things you want to avoid. You want to avoid using a shock collar. I recommend that. I, you know, shock collars have been a, a, a subject that have come up quite a bit recently. Uh, kind of since the, we did the Standing Stone podcast, we talked with those guys and someone said, you guys should do a debate. I, I, we're probably going to. Um, and, and so, but the, and, and I won't even get into that right now, but the thing about it is, in reality, and you talk to a shock collar person, because I'm not going to tell you how to use a shock collar. I don't know how to. I've never used one. And I never will. I don't need one. But the, everything I've studied, learned, read about, talked to, watched, they all say the same thing. Now, whether they do it or not is the question, but they all say the same thing. The, sh the shock collar is not a, training, not a training tool. 
doesn't train the dog to do anything. It reinforces something you've already trained. My, it's always my question of then why do you need it? If you've already trained the dog to do something, you shouldn't need a collar to enforce it. But the reality is, is if you use the collar, if you're looking to use a collar the way that they're designed, you've got to train the dog to recall before you can put a collar on it. If the dog doesn't respect you, part of it is a respect thing, I think, right now. You've lost, the dog's lost respect for you. The dog has cre- def- defined itself as the leader in your relationship, probably in some situations. Now, I look at it as you got to set yourself up to be successful. That's the responsibility of you as the trainer. If I took a dog that doesn't recall confidently to an area that I lost 100% of the control to them, they can do whatever they want and there's nothing I can do about it. And then I ask them to recall and they don't recall and I get frustrated about it, whose fault is it? You knew the dog didn't recall well and you're in a situation that you can't control them. So you got to change your situation so that you can train successfully. You got to figure out how to get in a long channel and work the dog back and forth. I worked Bella today on back casting and I used the transition between plow, fresh tilled dirt, which is brown and just a flat dirt that's been tilled up. And then a clover patch that's green and growing. It looked, it was a nice straight edge. I used that today to help her recall back to me on a straight line. And then when I asked her to stop on a whistle and send her back, she would turn around and go straight away from me. Not to the right faded, not to the left faded. Because if she faded to the right, she'd go way out into the brown field. If she faded to the left, she'd be in the clover. So what is the dog's natural tendency is to run along that, that edge. It's also, it works against me at times. So sometimes we send a dog horizontal to the plane. So where the, where the cover changes, it, let's envision it as the shape of a T. So I send the dog on a straight line and horizontally at 180 degrees or 90 degrees, I guess it would be, 90 degrees to the right, 90 degrees to the left is a brush line or a tree line or a grass line or some type of a change in terrain or a road, something like that, where the dog hits it and at 90 degrees, a lot of dogs have a hard time pushing through that. Watch any of our videos, I work on it with our dogs a lot, pushing through those barriers. Well, those barriers are natural things that alter the way the dog wants to go. And so we train them to overcome that. But I also look at it and go, let's use it to our advantage when we're working on certain things. So if I need to have a dog go a straight line, if I recall a dog to me, I don't want them lollygagging around. I don't want them making the S shape. I don't want them making uh, figure eights. I don't want them making a loop-de-loops. I, I want them to come to me. Shortest point, shortest distance is a straight line from point A to point B. So if they're at point A and I'm at point B, I want them coming straight line, connect A to B. So if you're, if you're struggling on recall, work on recall. And I don't even care how old the dog is. You could be 10 weeks or 10 months or 10 years. If they don't recall well, that's what you need to work on. And in the meantime, when you're not working on that stuff, you need to eliminate all those opportunities for the dog to say, I'm not going to listen now and I'm going to run away. I I went through it with Bella. I've gone through it with every single dog I've trained. I talk a lot about Bella now because Bella's in training. But every dog I've trained, every single one of them, has gone through these spurts where they just disregard me. It's rebellious. It's teenager-ish. It's it's frustrating as all can be. And so I fix that by saying, eliminate their opportunity to do it. Put them on a leash. And a lot of people will say, there's no way I'm doing that forever. No, I didn't say do it forever. I said do it until they stop disrespecting you. Earn the respect back. This Everything I tell you guys to do isn't permanent. It's not forever. It's until the behavior changes. It's to help modify and change behavior. And if you modify and change behavior, then you can start getting different things out of them from a result standpoint. If, the do- if I tell you, if the dog doesn't come to you when you call them, if the dog runs away from you, that's exactly what you got, you're facing right now. The dog wants to run away from you. He wants to leave you. The only way you're getting the dog back is going by the truck and tricking him into thinking you're leaving. 
Okay, and then you brought up the idea of you don't want to put a shock collar on him, you don't want to spank him. And I'm going to ask you, well, when would you use that stuff? When would you spank the dog? After the dog, you can't spank it when it does not with you. So when would you use that technique of spanking? Like I don't, I'm not recommending you spank the dog because let's play this out. Dog won't come. The dog won't come. The dog won't come. The dog won't come. You trick him by pretending you're going to leave. Dog comes running to you, and then you spank it. Dog connects the previous action with the result. So what did it do before it got spanked? It came running to you. And now you're spanking it. So he's going, screw it. Now I'm not even going to come when he goes to the truck. And you're going to go, damn you. I'm just going to get more mad about it. And then you're going to go, now I'm going to put a collar on it. What the hell is a collar going to do? Just punish the dog? You got to get this dog. First off, what you got to do is get the dog to come to you. Set it up so the dog doesn't go away and can't get away from you. Then get the dog to come to you. And when the dog comes to you, instead of thinking, you son of a gun, you're going to go, man, I really appreciate you coming. Thank you. Pet you. Praise you. Hell, I'll, I'll go this far. Use kibble. I don't, I'm not a treat trainer. You know that. Use kibble. Get the dog to start out coming to you and you give him some kibble. I used kibble the other day. I didn't use kibble. I used... Uh, I used smoked lake trout skins. So I smoked some fish uh, last week. I love smoking fish. So I have my buddy. He's got a place up on Lake Superior. Lake Superior is some of the finest. I mean, it's, it is a delicacy. So he brought me some. Well, I smoked some because I love smoked fish. And so I peeled off that lake, lake, lake trout skin and I give it to the dogs. It's fantastic for their coats. It's full of oils. Uh, it's just really good stuff. It's, a, like a, it's like a fish oil pill, but it's the skin. So I give it to the dogs, and they love it. It is, I mean, I think I'd eat it. I don't, but I, I love smoked fish. I'd probably eat it myself if I had to. But I give it to the dogs. It's like the treat that they get around here. And it doesn't happen that often. But, so I'm giving it, I give it to Taylor, I give it to Ellie, I give it to Spry, I'm giving it to Bella. And Bella has a tendency lately where she doesn't want to go into her kennel voluntarily. Just all of a sudden. But when I think about it, I go, you know what? It's probably been happening slowly and gradually for some time. And I just all of a sudden recognize it and go, oh, all of a sudden. A lot like Jacob says, all of a sudden he's got this issue. Well, it didn't happen overnight, guarantee you. So I have this issue. She doesn't want to go in the kennel. So what did I do? I'm giving her fish oil. I'm giving her the, the fish skins. And I decided, you know what? You're going to earn it, Bella. And so I, I bring her over and I tell her to kennel up. And she knows I've got this treat for her. And she knows she's going to get it. And she, she hesitates to go in the kennel. So I don't give her the treat. So I tell her to kennel up. And I literally put my hand on her and I kind of give her a little help push, a little shove to her butt. And into the kennel she goes like she normally would. And then she turned around and I gave her that fish skin. She went, hmm, that was really good. So I called her back out. Now I tore the pieces, I tore it into 10 little pieces. And so I had her sit. I told her how good she was. I didn't give her fish skin for sitting. She, you know, we don't have any issues with that. I tell her sit, she sits. It's not our, our struggle. The struggle is going in the kennel. So I tell her to kennel back up. Well, that time she went pretty voluntarily and I gave her a little piece of fish skin. And then I called her back out. And I did it all under control. And I had a very eager to please working little dog right there. And so 10 times in a row, roughly, she went shooting into her kennel, turned around, sat nice and patiently, and I gave her some fish skin. And then towards the end, I gave her fish skin every other time, and I praised her in between. And now, she's all of a sudden, in the last week, she's kenneling up really, 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 really uh, happily. She's real willing. Now, I don't give her fish skin every time. I've been praising her. At some point, I might have to sweeten the pot a little bit. I might have to give her a little bit of something. Just to keep her with that enthusiasm. But that's an example of bend the rules. I'm not saying you can't use food. I'm saying don't get in the habit of it. Don't buy yourself a fanny pack that you have to wear all the time in order to get a dog to listen to you. But use something to get the dog to focus on you and go, I should pay more attention to him than just deciding to do my own thing. And then I think you got to assess the situation and go, where is this coming from? It's got to be deeper rooted than all of a sudden just one day the dog decides to run away. It's something else has happened to slowly break down this trust, slowly to break down this respect. I think it's a two-way street. The dog needs to respect you as well as you need to respect it. 
And so I oftentimes find that the issues I have is when I get busy and decide that other things are more important and I'm not doing what I need to do with, with Bella in this scenario. And then all of a sudden I get upset because things all of a sudden have eroded and it smacks me in the face. And I go, Jesus, dog doesn't even listen anymore. Well, you've been blind to it for a while. You've been, you've been turning, looking the other way. Something has happened where you've been distracted maybe. And now all of a sudden you go, wow. And so the answer is don't panic. Don't make drastic, dramatic changes. Go back to the beginning and start fixing those problems one at a time. And there is nothing wrong with it. Because who cares how long it takes? If we're talking about the 10-month-old dog, you got a 10-month-old dog. It's May. What are you going to be doing in the next three to four months of it? Nothing. Work through these problems. By the time you get to fall, hopefully you got the wheels back on. But the problem is, is I sense in, the, in reading the messages, you got this downhill motion right now. You're going downhill. It's just you're going the wrong way. And there's a lot of momentum building up. And wheels are starting to really get loose to the point where they're almost falling off. And so you can respond a couple different ways. The last thing I would do is just close my eyes, step on the gas pedal and hope for the best. Because you're just, it's not going to end pretty. I wouldn't abandon ship. I wouldn't just jump out and let it go. I'd start figuring out, is there some way for me to pump the brakes here a little bit? Is there some way for me to slow things down? Can I gear it down? Can I, can I shift this vehicle into a lower gear to start forcing it to slow down? Because speeding up isn't going to do it. You've got to figure out a way to slow things down until you get back under control. Then once you get it back under control, I don't know that I'd just slam the foot down on the gas again. I'd just cruise for a little while and level out and take a deep breath and get the white knuckles off the, the steering wheel and just relax a little bit and work my way back into some positive things. But you cannot, you cannot, you will not be able to just wish this stuff away. You will not be able to just frustrate, be frustrated and have it, you know, get, get to a point of anger and, and orderiness where all of a sudden it goes away. Because what it's going to do is it's going to continually snowball and ruin your, ruin your relationship with the dog. You're going, to start hold, you're going to start having hard feelings and not giving, getting rid of those hard feelings. You're going to start holding grudges against this dog. And as you do that, the dog's going to go, I really don't want to be around him anymore. He's an asshole. Nobody wants to be around that. And so now all of a sudden, as you build a wall, the dog's going to build a wall. Here's the nice part about the dog. The dog will forgive you for being a jerk. The dog will forgive you for being, doing really stupid stuff. The dog doesn't hold it against you that you didn't do a good job with it. And, I, and I'm, now this is Buddy again telling you just the way it is. You didn't do as good of a job as you thought you did. That's okay. But what do you do about it now? So the beauty of the dog is the dog doesn't hold it against you. And it'll forgive you. It'll, it's already forgotten about it. That's the nice part about dogs. You can be, dogs will love you. Dogs love jerks. That's how nice a dog is. People that are mean, dogs still love them. Because dogs have, there's a book that I read, and it says how dogs have all the skills that God intended for us to have, man to have, but he doesn't. Loyalness, caring, loving, all these, all these things, dogs have it. And that's the nice part about them. So what, we, what you need to do is, and I, I'm going to send you a message and say, hey, we did a podcast on it, but uh, take a step back. Start fixing one thing at a time. Dissect all the issues you're having and fix the b most basic broad of them and then build on that and then build on that. Put, I, got, I got news for you. Put the dog on a leash. And am I saying you're going to have the dog on a leash for the rest of its life? No, but you're going to have it on a leash until you can get through some of these issues. Bella, Bella, and, and let's, let's not, I think we have a, way too much pride and arrogance as trainers to the idea of looking down on the idea of a dog that has to be on lead. 
I mean, yeah, ultimately we want to put it, we all, we want, my goal is to have all dogs off lead all the time. Realistically, I, I get more and more of the percentage of time off lead as we go. But I, I Ben, today when we did Bella, I had, I had, had her on lead probably, and Bella arguably heals better than, I, get, I guarantee you Bella heals better than Jacob's dog. I don't even know Jacob's dog, but Bella heals better than it. I, I, I bet. I, I, Bella heals better than a lot of dogs. She doesn't heal good enough to be off lead all the time. I would say in our session today, she was off lead, or she was on lead probably 50% of the time. And when I took her off lead, technically she still was wearing the adjustable leader collar for probably another 25%. Truly, truly off lead, I think it was less than 25% of the time. Mm -hmm. She wasn't off lead 100% until the very end when I sent her on a really long retrieve and she was going to go into some brush. Mm -hmm. So the other rest of the time, she was either on lead where I had the end of it or she had at least the adjustable leader collar. And that's a transitional tool. It's exactly why we use it. Because we go from 100% control where I can make a correction with the lead to still having the weight of it, still having the ability for her to reach down and get a hold of it if I need to. But technically, she kind of, she has a lot more freedom than, than she did if I was holding on to the end of the lead. And then you take the collar off. And one of the drills we did today, we practiced taking the drill on, or the collar on and off for multiple times. Mm -hmm. Hell, that's stuff I've been doing with her since she was 12 weeks old. We're still doing it, Jacob. And I don't care. I think you have to do stuff repeatedly and it's there's so what i'm saying is is don't get the idea of oh god i gotta put the dog back on a lead so what I, most people most people should have their dogs on a lead more often than they do because they're, they just we just don't have enough our, our heel work is never good enough mine is never good enough with my dogs there's time yesterday i put Yesterday I was working our group dog, our group of dogs together. I put Spry on lead because she just was a half, she was a step and a half ahead for me. So finally I said, "Enough, put her on lead." There's no shame in it. And you know what? I didn't have to correct her then because she just slid right into heel position. So it's it's a nice. There's nothing wrong with taking that step back. So Jacob, that I'm going to send you a message to let you know we did a podcast. I don't have no idea what number it's going to be, but. Um, we are going to, I, that's enough, that's long enough, huh? It's like a yeah. 30 minute one. Um, we've been getting a little long. I do like doing a little bit shorter ones. So we're not going to touch on any more. We're going to record a couple other ones. Um, but that's going to be a, that's a pod for you guys. I hope that helps. Um, I don't think Jacob is alone. I think a lot of people struggle with the same issues. It sounds like Jacob has waited too long to address some of it. Or he... Something has happened where it's just all of a sudden smacked him in the face. I'm telling you, it didn't happen overnight. But now you're there. So now you're, at least you're facing it, dealing with it. Now, don't think, because it smacked you in the face, don't think you can turn around and knock it out in one swing either. You're going to have to chip away at it. Just like I chip away with everything I do with my dogs. So we're in the same boat. We're all in this. We're all in the same position. You guys, thank you for your support. Another podcast in the books. We're going to, do, we're going to record a couple of them here um, in our intentions. And I appreciate it greatly. I've gotten lots of messages back from people that say, hey, we, you really are putting a lot of stuff out there. It is our hope, our, our plan. Ben and I have made this um, push where we said this COVID is not going to bring us down. We are going to stay positive. We are going to stay healthy. We're going to stay safe. And we're going to help you that are struggling with it as well. And so... It is our intention to YouTube. Um, we're putting out, what, three different series right now? Mm -hmm. Every day, at least one is going. Oh, the baby's coming back in, so we're going to wrap this one up. We're doing at least one or two new postings on YouTube. Instagram and Facebook are getting multiple postings. Um, so please, at Dog100, follow those. If you could, leave us a review. Um, and if you, if you are ordering, we've, we've been doing, there's a lot of people ordering stuff online through our website. We, we sell everything. Our, we're hundred percent operational. We just, we just don't have people working, many people working at a time, but we are shipping through our warehouse and Amazon. We are supplying through Amazon. So a lot of people are comfortable with the shopping through Amazon. So that's another option. If you would, please leave us a review there too. 
uh, you guys don't realize how important it is right now for small businesses like ours, particularly small businesses that are making stuff here in the States. It's really, really hard, um, difficult times. And those little things that you do make huge differences. They help us greatly. So if you'd be willing to do that, we'd appreciate it. Share this with somebody that you think it might help. Uh, stay safe, healthy, and positive, and we will continue to bring you guys as much information as we can.